I was really getting into the music. Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Saganesh Salawa. I'm an assistant professor in internal medicine at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Welcome to the final session of mini, of mini medical school, Healthy Planet and Healthy Lives. We're excited to have you here with us today, and we look forward to guiding you through this third topic in this series, which is what would a better future look like and how can we get there? We hope you were here in the past few weeks to hear our introduction to planetary health and what we can do to create change. And if you're not able to join us, if you were not able to join us, please watch for those recordings after this session. We will begin with a moderated discussion followed by a question and answer session. You can submit your questions to our panelists at any time using the Q&A button that can be found by clicking on that button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please note this session is being recorded. It will be available starting tomorrow on the Office of Academic uh, Clinical Affairs YouTube channel. And we will share the link of the recording with you by email. So last week, we discussed what we can do to bring about change with examples for sustainable development programs from the University of Minnesota and Morris. Uh, we learned about developing a stewardship ethic in young children through exposure to outdoors and outdoor systems. We also learned about systems approach to tackling complex planetary health issues. And today we have the privilege of speaking with a panel of experts on how we can alter our current trajectory. Um, we get to start today with uh, Lee uh, uh, Freilich. I didn't, I think I said that right. Okay, good. Okay, Dr. Freilich is the director of the Center for Forest Ecology. His research interests include large scale fire and wood, earthworm invasion, and climate change in temporal and boreal forests. Dr. Freilich, we're excited to have you discuss with us what about discuss forest ecology and its impacts on uh, planetary health. Well, thanks for that introduction. I'm happy to be here. And um, thanks to everybody who is attending. And let me just get my slides up. So I'm going to talk about forests and planetary health. And there's three parts here. The first part is reforestation. Uh, potential tree cover on this planet is 10.9 billion acres, and we currently have only 6.9 billion acres covered with forest. And what happened to the rest is it was cut down by people and converted into other land uses. So we have a lot of reforestation to do. Furthermore, if you look at just those areas that currently have a climate that would support forests, and they're not needed for agriculture. It's about 2.2 billion acres, which is shown on this map. That's an area about the size of the United States. It's about 6% of the Earth's land surface. So there's plenty of places to plant trees. Uh, we could plant a trillion trees on these 2.2 billion acres. That would be enough to completely fill it with trees. And that would be about 125 seedlings per person globally. And whenever I ask one of my classes, can we plant 125 seedlings per person on this planet, say over the next 10 years? And everybody nods, yes, of course we can do that. Uh, we could, if we did that, as they grew over the next 50 years, they would pull about 100 parts per million CO2 out of the atmosphere. And that would stabilize the the rising CO2 content of the atmosphere, and that would buy us a few decades of time during which we could complete the switch to renewable energy. And we have an example project that is associated with the University of Minnesota, the Green Again Madagascar project. Um, and it was started by one of our former graduate students in the, the forest resources department. And he went to Madagascar and um, quit his job on Wall Street and moved to Madagascar and decided to restore the rainforest. And that's the purple zone on this map of Madagascar. And where we're working is the yellow star. There are 7,000 species of plants found nowhere else on Earth. 
And after a century of deforestation, it's only 11% of, uh, of the former area. So via this project, we're going to restore the rainforest. But of course, to restore that, it requires local knowledge and local expertise everywhere in the world. You always have to plant local species. You have to plant the right species on the right site. And you see in the picture here, our local expertise in Madagascar. We have about 80 people there who are working with us on this reforestation project. And we're, we have a nursery with 58 species of native trees. And believe it or not, they all do not have scientific names. And we're using the, the local names that the local Malagasy um, citizens have called each tree. Uh, but very important to have local people involved everywhere in the world. It's not like you can take one species of tree and, and put it everywhere. So that's reforestation. Part two, protecting existing forests. We don't need to cut down any more of the forest that we haven't cut down. This shows um, converting a rainforest in Indonesia to a palm oil plantation. Um, it's basically that and clearance for, for um, especially for cattle agriculture to turn it into grazing fields. Those are the two main forces, uh, uh, types of deforestation at this point on the planet. But there are still intact forests. So this map shows in, in gold all the areas of the earth that can support forest. And then the green areas are the so-called intact forests, those areas that have not been cleared. They have a continuous heritage over tens of thousands of years of only natural disturbances and close to nature human disturbances. In other words, indigenous people who were managing the, the forest in concert with nature. So these intact forest landscapes, which include the Amazon, the Congo, and a huge swath of Canada, actually, the boreal forest that goes across the northern part of North America is actually the largest intact forest in the world, and other big ones are in Russia. And very important to save these. Um, this is an intact forest landscape in the upper peninsula of Michigan, where I did my PhD uh, work studying the dynamics of this forest. Uh, which is sugar maple and hemlock trees up to 550 years old. Um, intact forests store huge amounts of carbon. They, they harbor most of our terrestrial biodiversity on this planet. We can use them as blueprints. If we study how they function naturally, we can use them as blueprints in order to develop what we call close to nature forest management practices. And when you use those practices, you can store more carbon even in a commercial forest where you're harvesting for timber, as long as you try to mimic the dynamics of a natural forest. And we also need to allow some of our forests to get older and to respond naturally to fire and wind disturbances, and that will help them store more carbon as well. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that most of the carbon in forests after they're disturbed by big fires or windstorms is still present after the disturbance. This is after a fire in the Boundary Waters canoe area in northern Minnesota. Even in the big fires out in California that they've had in the last few years, usually 80% of the carbon is still there after the fire. And the seedlings are regenerating and they're tiny. They're only an inch tall. And so it's important to avoid going in and salvaging that timber and squishing all the regenerating seedlings with the, the machinery, emitting lots of carbon dioxide and cutting down the, the standing dead trees so that they then rot. Um, it's important to allow forests to respond in a natural way to natural disturbance because they've been doing it for 300 million years. So that's a long time uh, before people were ever managing forests. They know how to do it. The climate problem that we have is the race to protect existing forests and plant new ones before climate change itself reduces the area where forests can grow. I showed you those 2.2 billion acres earlier. 
if we allow the climate to warm up by four or five degrees Celsius worldwide, a lot of those areas will no longer even be suitable for tree species. And the stars on here um, show some of those areas that are vulnerable to converting from a climate that supports forests to not supporting forests. And that includes the Amazon, which could become a savanna uh, grassland with scattered trees. You'll notice one of the stars is in northern Minnesota. The southern boreal from northern Minnesota up to Alberta is a, recognized by the IPCC as a tipping point for the world. The southernmost 300 miles of that forest could die and convert to grasslands um, for a business as usual climate scenario. And we don't want that to happen. Um, looking at Minnesota, you see on the right um, research that we did to map out the climates of Minnesota, the blue would support boreal forest, which is spruce and fir. The green mixed boreal and temperate, the yellow is temperate, which is maple and oak and linden, and then the brown is prairie out in the very western part of Minnesota. If we go on a low CO2 emission scenario, by 2070, Minnesota will still look pretty much like it does now. There'll be a little bit of northward movement of these biomes. But if we go on the business as usual scenario, which is labeled high here, that's when we become the new Kansas. Um, and 90% of the state would support grasslands and not forests. And of course, that would extend all the way up to northern Alberta, uh, if you look across the continent. So I was quoted in the Washington Post as saying, we have a perfectly good Kansas in the United States now. We don't need a second Kansas in Minnesota. And that ended up in the, the lead paragraph of an article. And that's when I found out what it's like to get global feedback from people who believe in climate change and people who don't believe in climate change. But anyway, we don't need another Kansas in Minnesota. We want Minnesota to have three biomes, the boreal forest, the timber forest, and the prairie like it does now. We don't want to lose um, our boreal biome. Same in Europe. This is some research I did with my friends at the Institute of Dendrology, which is part of the Polish National Academy of Sciences. And you see the green in the map on the left. That is the range of Scots pine, which is a major forest forming species in Europe. And in the map on the right, all that red area, that is area where Scots pine would no longer grow. In other words, all that forest would die for a business as usual scenario. So the same scenario in Europe as in Minnesota. So um, just to, to summarize, we need to keep our intact forests that have never been logged. Um, we need to keep them intact. We need to restore all of our commercial timber producing forests using close to nature forestry practices that we learn by observing these intact forests. We let, need to let more forests get older and we need to reforest the deforested areas so we win that race and, and keep the climate from changing and and um, causing a lot less acreage on the planet where trees would be able to grow. So that concludes my remarks. And I think we're not going to take questions until everybody has spoken. So I will stop share. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you. That is interesting. It is bringing up a lot of questions for me, as I'm sure it is for the audience. So I just encourage everyone to add the questions to the Q&A. Um, and we'll get back to that because you've got you've got some wheels turning for me. All right, next we want to welcome Clement Lou. Dr. Lou is a uh, oh, Clement. What Clement Lou? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, my name. Uh, you know, I practiced in my head, but anyway, Dr. I've Lou been called much worse things. <laughs> my name is Laganish Sanamov, so I I appreciate the grace. Uh, so Dr. Lou is an assistant professor of environmental studies at the University of Minnesota Morris and the student success coordinator for the Office of Equity, Diversity and Intercultural Programs. So Dr. Lou, can you discuss with us um, developing how we're developing this next generation of leaders and preparing them to live in a more sustainable world? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question and thanks everybody for listening. So um, one small disclaimer. Uh, I have much more boring slides than Lee, or I have a single boring slide for everybody. 
So, uh, yeah, uh, while the other panelists are sciencey folks and do sciencey things and have fun sciencey pictures, uh, I'm a philosopher, so I just do things with words. Uh, and here are some of the words that I want to talk to you about. So, uh, a couple of weeks ago, when I got asked to do this panel, uh, I got my question, right? We chose to talk about um, what leaders, future leaders, need to think about when we're uh, thinking about making a world that's more sustainable. And I wanted to say something unexpected, right? I didn't want to say something boring that people would expect. And so what I decided to talk about was, I think, an idea that new leaders, young leaders, future leaders, maybe even current leaders, should be attending to. And that concept is one that's introduced by uh, a friend of mine, Ian Workheiser, who's a, a philosopher of technology and an environmental philosopher. And the idea is epistemic self-determination. So that's like uh, the one thing that's on my slide, because um, when I talk to my friends who are communications folks or advertising folks, they always say, make sure in anything that you like give to the public that there is a single ask. So my single ask is for folks to think about this idea, right? This idea of epistemic self-determination, which uh, and which is defined by Ian as the ability of community members to jointly determine and engage in the epistemic practices of their community, which can include methodologies for gaining knowledge, as well as evaluative assumptions for accepting or rejecting knowledge. So essentially, it's helping folks be able to set the grounds for uh, them getting information and using information and having conversations about information, right? So I think this is an important idea because um, for anyone who's sort of paying attention to issues related to sustainability or public health or environment, um, the communities that are most adversely affected are also the communities that tend to be marginalized, right? They tend to be economically marginalized. They tend to be politically mar marginalized. So they're folks who history throughout history have tended to not have as much access to discourse, right? They're, they have been excluded from governance. They've been excluded from decision-making. They've been excluded from being able to sort of chart the direction of our society. And so when we're thinking about addressing sustainability problems or public health problems or environmental problems, we should be thinking about how those communities can be uh, can have their capacity built so that they're better able to self advocate, right? And self advocacy and epistemic self determination is important because um, it allows communities to more effectively autonomously define goals, uh, to more autonomously define how they 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 want to associate and engage in discourse. And how to the how they prioritize different objectives when evaluating different ideas or options or solutions or problems, um, and all of that is important for participation in governance and collective decision making. Right, it allows communities to define how they gather evidence, what evidence is gathered, and the frameworks for determining what are costs and benefits when it comes to various problems. And it also thinking, also thinking about epistemic self determination, allows us uh, a way to think about how we build capacity for internal deliberation within communities, and so that they can better participate and more effectively participate in broader discourse by being able to uh, better collectively plan and build solidarity and develop ideas. Um, and finally. Uh, epistemic self-determination is important because it allows communities to internally generate policy alternatives um, to those that are considered outside of those communities and to more effectively advocate for those internally generated policy alternatives. Um, I think I'm going to stop here to make sure that everybody has enough time to go through their presentations. And I can uh, talk more about this and what I think might be ways to pursue uh, and advocate for and support epistemic self-determination of marginalized communities in the Q&A.
What? I feel like that was a teaser. No, this is really good. It's kind of forcing us to think about how we develop this leadership in young people. So, all right, let's, we'll, we'll keep that to the Q&A. All right, and rounding us off is Heidi Group. Dr. Group is the director of the University of Minnesota Climate Adaptation Partnership and the assistant professor of climate science and extension specialist. Um, her research and extension program combine cutting edge climate science and effective science communication to increase the use of climate change information in decision making. As part of her science communication efforts, she recently wrote a book called The Climate Action Handbook, and that's going to be published in March of 2023. So, Dr. Roop, can you tell us or uh, talk to us about how individuals can affect change when it comes to planetary health? Great, thank you for that. And um, then so excellent to hear um, from my fellow panelists and look forward to the discussion. So um, buckle in, I'm gonna go quickly. I've been asked and tasked with, I think a very hard question. Unfortunately, um, I have was primed in that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about action um, and climate action in particular. So um, just pulled actually from the book, was encouraged to sort of bring that into this conversation tonight um, and really thinking about how can we act for planetary health and again, coming from this lens of climate action, which of course um, is everything action because climate change is a through line um, in many of the decisions that are made and many of our lived experiences and future to be lived experiences in the future. Um, so just a bit of context of where I'm coming from and who I am. So I'm a climate scientist, but with a particular interest in application. Um, confronting the moment in front of us and understanding that data and information are valuable and important and needed, but so is action. And we shouldn't let the desire for more or more perfect um, information prevent us from acting today in the many ways that we can, both as individuals um, and as a collective, as we confront um, this planetary and climate health crises in front of us. Um, so at the Climate Adaptation Partnership, we really work in collaboration, in partnership with community to think about how it is we understand the problems um, that we are facing in different communities, and importantly, how to understand and right size and identify um, the most appropriate and place specific solutions. And then of course, work towards implementing the actions needed to help address those problems. So really thinking about partnership and our name has jargon in it. So I thought I'd just sort of contextualize before we talk about specific actions that individuals can engage in in this space, just sort of talk about this overlapping Venn diagram of climate action. Um, which I often describe as both um, preventing the problem from getting worse and preparing for the changes we've already set in motion. So prevention is mitigation. This is something we hear a lot about. Um, probably more of our, our lexicon around climate change is related to mitigation and actions that help reduce um, or prevent the emissions of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the, the source of the problem. And on the other hand, we know very clearly from the science that we also are in a position now as a society that we have to prepare for the climate changes we know we've already set in motion. Many that we are already living through, whether you call Minnesota home or some other island nation or community, we are all experiencing some form of climate change. Um, and that is again, supported by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, in their most recent assessment report basically said, climate change is everywhere um, and we need to prepare. Um, and so our organization is really looking at this preparation piece as a core focus, um, acknowledging there's an imperative to act while we also seek to mitigate or prevent the problem from getting worse. Um, and in both cases, we still choose. That is the chapter is yet to be written on climate change. And so that is why um, we need to all act. Um, so I have been tasked with talking about, um, in the context of this book, I was basically a journey of my own wanting to provide a more substantive answer to the question, what can I do about climate change? And there are lots of things we hear about that are very important, like changing your light bulbs and things that are part of our, our uh, the more normal traditional conversation around carbon footprints and other things. But I really wanted to understand what are the myriad ways we can show up as individuals because we all have different capacities, we have different interests, we come from different backgrounds, yet that shouldn't preclude anyone from finding a way to see themselves in the solution or creating or shaping or writing that chapter that has yet to be written um, for communities around the world, right? Even under a changing climate, we still choose. 
So what can you do? And again, I have to cram this into six minutes. I'm timing myself. Um, so buckle in. I've got sort of four key categories. And again, there's lots we can talk about. And I hope we can surface that in the conversation. But as I was reflecting on this in the context of planetary health, what are four things? Um, I'm going to start with centering action in your strengths and passions. And why? Because climate change and planetary health, these are all hands on deck situations. And what we shape and create together needs rich diversity of perspectives and approaches. And in order to do that, we have to be thinking in different ways. We have to be thinking creatively and we have to be thinking collaboratively. And the only way we do that is if you find ways that lean into your strengths and your interests, right? You may not care about changing light bulbs, but you might care about using art or dialogue as an important way to motivate and catalyze dialogue and action in your community. So we don't wanna stay siloed in our work. We don't wanna have carbon tunnel vision where we're only thinking about an end game that's related to carbon emissions, but we need to also be thinking about our community health, community resilience. How can we show up with and bring what we are good at and what we love into the conversation and into the actions that we choose to take? So in that context, trying to encourage us to move beyond the carbon footprint, um, which is actually something that has been promoted by the fossil fuel industry um, to shift the blame from industry to individual. Um, but we should be thinking about our climate action footprint. So a balanced portfolio of thinking, not just about emissions reduction, which are vitally important, but also ways that our actions enhance individual and community climate resilience. And that includes health and well being, this idea of planetary health. So, what do we need to do? Well, I already talked about prevention, right? This is the mitigation piece, and this is rapid decarbonization. Um, so, we know that the global energy mix is still dominated by oil, coal, and gas. These are the burning or combustion of these materials are what are predominantly driving the climate change challenge we're facing. More greenhouse gases means more planetary warming, means, means more severe impacts of, of, from climate change, right? So global warming leads to these to climate changes, right? And those are the impacts that we feel and navigate and are anticipating in the future. So we described the different scenarios out of the future. The big unknown with climate change is not about what could happen. It's not about the physics of the atmosphere. It's about human behavior and whether we will choose one path over the other. So the biggest source of uncertainty in what the future holds, it's not science, it's society, right? Is what will we do as people um, and as a collective to confront this challenge? So again, the choice is still ours. The chapter has yet to be written. In the context of planetary health, and again, there's so much data to substantiate this and not enough time, but our efforts to transition to renewable energy can bring near immediate human health impacts and benefits, this meaning like improving air quality. Many of these impacts are disproportionately um, felt on communities that are, are often exposed. There's disproportionate impacts depending on the community you come from, the color of your skin this is very well documented. Um, that there is an inequitable exposure to the, the harms of climate change and the negative impacts from the combustion of fossil fuels. Um, so we know that a transition not only can immediately improve air quality and bring human health benefits, but it can also translate into relatively quickly, and in some cases long-term, over the long-term as thinking about trees, um, improved planetary health. Um, and importantly, the dollars and cents stack up. So if you're worried about costs, um, it's also clear that renewable energy is some of the cheapest electricity in history. Um, and so again, the, the, the odds are against oil and gas. Um, if we think about a, a climate context, we think about a cost context, and we think about the benefits to humans and our well-being. So what can you do as an individual? Of course, there are some of us have the capacity and others don't to sort of think about how we, we use renewable energy or not. Um, but we can think about how we opt for more energy efficiency in our home. This again can be things like all the way from light bulbs to solar panels to um, insulation to trying your heating and cooling, electrification. And again, we can talk on and on about this and I can share resources, but where you can opt into energy efficiency um, again, you'll be more comfortable, likely healthier, and you can also save money um, and opt into renewable energy if you can. In Minnesota, there is a program you can opt into renewable energy through um, different energy suppliers because at present, a bulk of our energy comes from coal. Um, but you can opt into more renewable energy sources um, if you are a purchaser of, of electricity in Minnesota, and that's true in many other um, states around the nation. 
water use. So water quality and quantity challenges are already stressing natural and human systems. We see this play out in the West Coast. We see this play out in many parts of the globe. And in fact, we're seeing this play out in Minnesota. Um, we sort of have put fingerprints of climate change just in our last um, sort of 18 months of our, our climate context in Minnesota. We've experienced both extreme drought and severe flooding sort of back to back posing real challenges to our economy, which is driven predominantly by agriculture and other natural resources, but also on our communities, access to clean water, not being exposed to floods. Um, so thinking holistically about actions that can serve and protect our water resources, but also improve the management of vital water resources are essential. And this is a place where you can engage in community because a lot of decisions are made by our soil and water conservation districts, our water utilities, they are making critical decisions today that will impact our abilities to have clean, safe drinking water, and when there's too much water, manage that resource so that it doesn't cause damage. So um, this again depends on where you are, but this is also a good news story in climate context. The state of Minnesota is supporting a range of communities to plan for more effective stormwater management under climate change. Um, so there's lots of good news you can see here in ways you can engage in action in your community. Um, don't, I think Lee could probably comment on this more, um, but in the context of weaving back in forests, even if we think about just dietary changes alone, one study suggests that nearly 500 million acres of land could be freed up for other uses based on dietary changes. Um, this would enable more reforestation, um, all of the benefits that come from thinking about forests as a vital climate solution. Um, and that is something done by what you put on your dinner plate. And of course, as we think about reforestation, afforestation, and think about food access and how this intersects with climate, we of course need to manage lands in ways that tackle climate change and hunger together. And think about how we, as we think about where we put forests, how we manage our lands, we also need to be in active conversation with communities who are impacted by those decisions. Um, this is a really important conversation as we think about carbon offsets and credits and carbon taxes. Um, we do not want to encourage the purchasing of, of trees that maybe don't exist or displace um, important uh, agricultural lands for communities um, in other parts of the world. And this is a real big problem with the lack of verification of carbon credits at, in, at present. And finally, commit to communicate. This is something you can all do today. It is free of charge, but vitally important. Um, in Minnesota and many communities across the nation and the globe are working to make plans for climate change. What you want to see shaped for the future depends on your voice being part of this conversation. And again, increasingly we're seeing states and communities and counties and organizations providing more opportunities for community engagement in the development of these plans because they guide the priorities for what different organizations and municipal governments actually do and invest in. So if you want your voice heard, I encourage you to think about how to engage in climate and community planning. Um, Minnesota actually just released a climate action framework that has a range of goals that were in, uh, defined through participation of communities across the state. And I know I'm over time, so I'm going to go really quickly here. Um, but community groups, you're probably already engaged in a faith group, a community group, some collective. And there's an important role to think about those organizations as climate actors as ways to provide disaster response and recovery services, thinking about access to physical and mental health care, increasing out access to outdoor recreation. These are some things you've already heard through this series of conversations, but there are many ways that community organizations, even if the primary purpose is something else, there's a way to find a planetary health or climate action within the mission of that organization. And it might just be as simple as you surfacing that conversation within the community group or within community in order to leave that in as part of the narrative of what a community group is doing or how they might be and show up to build resilience and overall community well-being as we confront climate change. And then as an individual, we can't help those around us if we ourselves are not prepared. So as we know we'll be navigating through many climate extremes, it's really important to think about how to prepare yourself and your family. This sounds sort of silly, but I cannot tell you how many rooms of people I have stood in and asked, how many of you have a preparedness kit or have access to water and some source of power um, should you be going through some sort of weather or climate event. And often it is zero hands to one. 
um, anecdotally, like that puts us at the 1% of us um, are actually preparing. So I really encourage you to think about what it might look like for your family to be prepared to weather any storms that you may confront. And last but not least, we have to talk about the issue. Sorry, I kind of skipped my tagline here. Um, but long and short here is that while a majority of us think climate change is happening and we're concerned about it, we think it's affecting our weather and may have personal impacts, only 33% of us are hearing about climate change in the media and only 35% of us are actually talking about climate change in our communities, at least occasionally. So how can we expect an issue that touches everything to be important and to lead to that collective action if we aren't confident or capable or thinking about how to have conversations about climate change. And again, it isn't just about emissions reduction, it's about thinking about how you and your community can help shape the future that you want to create. That is the opportunity that climate change is affording us. And so I'm just gonna end here with my last um, slide, which is that we conducted the poll around Minnesota. And of course, I'm coming from Minnesota. I'm from Wisconsin, but I'm an honorary Minnesotan now. I'm here for almost three years. Um, I will say we're exceptional and generally above average and our polling results around our concerns around climate change and our desires for action and our hope that it will be done is higher than the national average with 76% of Minnesotans saying they're concerned about climate change, 62% of Gen Zers being hopeful that society will do enough to reduce the most severe impacts of climate change and 64% of us wanting to see more preservation and conservation of Minnesota's critical natural resources. And I will say around 80% of Minnesotans want to see state, local, and municipal governments doing more to confront climate change. So it's individual and collective, people are concerned, and we have hope, and today is the time to act. That was really great and inspiring. And I love how this um, conversation about community has threaded through all of the panelists, how community is really the key to being able to move forward and see ourselves, um, see ourselves through this and how to mobilize in that. So I want to kind of keep that thread going. Um, I would love to, there's a, we're going to go into the Q&A. So for those of you who are, who are part of this conversation, please start putting your questions in the Q&A. I have a stack of them to get through um, now as well. But uh, we just need a definition first. So Kama, can you talk a little bit, define this term uh, epistemic. epistemic? Epistemic. No, I got it. Epistemic. Sure. Can you define yeah. that for us so we can get, understand that? So it's a fancy way of saying knowledge, right? So and it's both like knowledge in terms of like, right, the ideas, but also the process of developing those ideas. So when you're talking about epistemic self-determination, it's about listening, right? So listening to ideas from a broad range of sources, making sure that folks are able to speak for themselves, and then thinking about process, right? Thinking about process for knowledge acquisition and knowledge sharing, and then thinking about how to make those processes accessible to everybody right so that it's so right if you're looking at i mean i was gonna say recent history but maybe just history right there is certainly a small group of people that gets to define the ways that our society communicates right so like um you know i mean a, a kind of a, maybe a pop cultural one is right there's a lot of people wringing hands about elon musk and twitter right but i i think in more formal settings right like uh international decision making is made in particular bodies with particular expectations and conventions and how people might participate in those conversations and those are not necessarily the conventions and processes and procedures that work best for the folks who might actually have the most pressing needs when it comes to environmental problems right so like uh Heidi had talked a lot about right like you know I, I think she was hinting at like social the social determinants of health and hinting about like um, how uh, disparities tend to happen along lines of race and class when it comes to outcomes related to the environment. And right, so the, the folks who are experiencing the the worst of those disparities are also the folks who are probably the least able to go to, you know, uh, um, right, the IPCC, like COP26 talks and right, like actively participate in them. 
Uh, and so when we're thinking about how do we work together, how do we plan together, how do we kind of in common work towards a better future, we really do need to think about how do we engage in knowledge creation, sharing, how do we set agendas, how do we have conversations, and then how do we do those in ways where everybody can participate in the ways that make sense of them. Yeah, that makes sense. And it ties in to how you get people engaged and how do you get them engaged in the solution as well as just understanding the problem. Totally understand that. This is gonna be a question that we're gonna start with Lee and then we're gonna open it up to everybody. There's a couple questions in the chat about consumerism, about kind of corporate greed and how those things are really driving deforestation. Um, and we're, there's questions about what can we do about that? What can we do about kind of corporate greed and, um, and consumer culture to battle these efforts both locally and globally? So Lee, we'll start with you and then uh, open it up to anyone else. Okay, yeah. Um, I think it's mostly the food industry, as Heidi said, that is leading to a lot of deforestation. Um, but corporate greed is also leading to harvesting forests when they're too young. Um, so if we aren't storing as much carbon across the landscape as we could if, if forests were a little bit older on average. Um, so those are the two main things. And actually, I, Heidi's probably better able to answer the rest of that question than I am. If, if it's OK to throw to her. Yeah, I could chime in. Um, yeah, I think it just the first things that come to mind, and I, I think this is one of the unfortunate challenges of climate solutions, is that for a lot of these things, many of the the burden of doing the research and thinking about accountability come back to the individual um, in the absence of more collective um, change or government regulation and action. Um, so in the context of, you know, sort of consumerism and, and I think from the corporate greed thing, right, where you shop, your, your wallet matters. Um, beware of greenwashing. A lot of these companies, especially when we start thinking about carbon credits and offsets and how they're buying and planting trees, right? There's the ad, you can hear it on national public radio almost every day, swipe your credit card, plant a tree. Um, so many of that specific program I've not looked into, but so many of these things don't, they, they lack verification. There's no third party verifying that what is being promised is actually being delivered. And so some of these adages, like too good to be true, probably is, um, and just have to be aware that there is a significant amount of research and behavioral science that shows that sustainability messaging and packaging and greenwashing pay, people are willing to pay more. And so there are companies taking advantage. And so I think, again, it's sort of some of that burden comes down to the individual to do the research, to shop your values. Um, and I mean, one of the things that I didn't say, and this again, comes back to the individual, but a majority of registered voters in the United States want to see government doing more. This is a place where they can do more. Um, and despite a majority of us wanting to see more action, 90% um, of us have report not ever contacting our elected officials um, to do, do anything. So we have to think beyond the ballot box, right? As this is November 9th, 2022, right? We just went through a midterm election, we really have to think beyond the ballot box, we have to think beyond the partisanship, and we have to start thinking about how we hold companies accountable and how we engage our elected officials to do the work on our behalf that they're elected to do. So again, broad sweeping big things that feel super overwhelming, but you can start by sort of shopping your values. And if you are fortunate enough to have a retirement account or do investments, um, investing, divesting, um, reinvesting are all powerful ways to signal your values. Um, and increasingly, we see more and more options available. So um, lots of things available to the individual, um, depending on um, who you are. Again, it sort of comes back to, and, and again, research, unfortunately, burden of work. I don't know if you have more to add, but those are some a few, a few thoughts, um, challenging as they are. Did, do you have anyone have anything else that uh i mean i just have one short idea i think actually heidi gave us a really good hint at this at the end of her remarks right 
I think we just need to talk about this more, right? So like, if you're thinking about mass social change, right? Like, I don't know, I'm I'm old enough to, to, to have seen the world change substantially from when I was younger. And that happens not always from the top down, right? It's often from the bottom up as people start talking about things, right? Like normalizing conversations about uh, things that we see as problems, talking about values, right? And then collectively shifting one another's sort of like mindsets when it comes to the what we see as status quo or like right the the conventional way of doing things yeah i think conversation is 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 critical right just as community and collective action are for a lot of these big problems that we're facing i think also remembering that there um that some of the burden is being placed on individuals unfairly or in an undue manner, whereas in like the responsibility and who needs to be held accountable is actually much higher than us. So when I don't have the power to do that, we may be able to do more. And then we as like a broader community and the political powers and pressures are able to kind of um, like synergistically increase the power of influence that we can have as well. So I think all of those things at the same time are sort of what you're saying, like all these things need to be happening at the same time, which I, I think is important. Um, there's a question here, speaking of conversations and engagement, um, what is a, uh, as a collective, what conversations and engagements are, are, are occurring with BRICS, which is Brazil, I just found this out too, so hold on a second with Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa regarding planting trees, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and water, et cetera. I think maybe again, we'll start with Lee, if you have um, insight into this. Well, the thing I would like to point out is um, Plant for the Planet is um, an organization that was started by a teenager in Germany and they have over a hundred sites around the world now you can go to the plant for planet website and you can click on the dots on the map and it will tell you all about each tree planting project and you can donate money to your favorite project um, in any part of the world um, there and they have really strict standards for taking care of the trees after they're planting no plant and abandon you know so that they most of them die um, for paying uh, good wages to the local people who are planting the trees and all of those things. Um, so there are some um, ways of verifying that those are happening, that things are, are um, being handled properly and that trees are actually being planted that will grow um, over time through Plant for the Planet, which is part of the Trillion Tree Project. Um, to plant more trees in the world. And so those projects are all over the world. Um, I don't have any special insight on Brazil and, and South Africa, I guess. And in line with that, have you guys, uh, someone is asking about reparations for developed countries to be paid by developed countries to developing nations who kind of bear the brunt of these out these uh, cl climate kind of catastrophes and pollution. Have you guys heard of any work around that or any equity work or, or reparation work around that? I don't know about reparations, but I do know that, right, like IPCC's agreements now include resource transfers from uh, the high income countries to the lower and middle income countries when it comes to adaptation. Uh, I think those might be the closest to reparations. Um, I, I suspect that might be what the question is asking about. I don't know though, <laughs> but I, I could proceed as if it were. And then my comment on that is that it depends on the resources and how the transfer is implemented, right? So like if it's resources that are actually useful for folks that are, are the sort of resources that the folks are asking for, that's, Right, good. That builds capacity. And I think if uh, those resources aren't dependent on uh, compliance with requirements that might not be appropriate or in line with the needs and wants of particular communities, that could be good. But if it's resource transfers that are resources that, you know, folks on this side of the ocean think folks on 
some other side of the ocean need and right like to get those resources folks need to to implement uh right mitigation and adaptation plans that are right consistent with our goals on this side of the ocean that probably is not necessarily helpful I can comment briefly on um, some of the broader kind of conversations that are happening um, in the context of the conference of parties that's happening right now in G Egypt. So this is um, part of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So these are the annual meetings. These are folks who have nations who have committed um, under the Paris Agreement and have signed on to the UN um, Triple um, C UNFCCC um, to have these conversations. And, and sort of right now, this is a two week sprint um, where negotiations and conversations are happening. Um, the main core themes for the conversation um, and for the agenda right now are mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage, and finance for climate change. And so that's probably where um, you're hearing this. It's in the news cycle. And one of the big conversations is that rich countries over a decade ago um, had committed $100 billion annually by 2020 to help developing countries um, uh, adapt to climate change. They have not yet made that promise. And there is actually a commitment to double, at least double finance for adaptation by 2025. So we haven't even met the milestone that's a decade old. And now the conversations are continuing to evolve and loss and damage is, is on the official agenda. And this is um, a conversation around who pays for the, the costs of climate change, given that a bulk of the emissions, the source of the problem come from very few um, predominantly wealthy nations have caused the problem, um, but other nations are bearing the brunt of these impacts. Um, and so there's a big conversation around who pays and whether there's a fund created to help um, different countries respond to and recover from the impacts of climate change. Um, lots of the wealthier countries want to avoid this conversation. Um, they're concerned about the creation of this fund because of legal liabilities and a bunch of other complications and really wanna focus on how developing nations can transition to renewable energy. So there's this real tug and pull, but finance and loss and damage are really important conversations that are happening right now. Some countries are making these commitments. Um, I don't, I hadn't followed the news today, but the US um, at present has remained silent um, on some of these commitments. And they're really important conversations around non-economic losses. So what happens um, to the loss of sacred lands? Um, or cultural heritage and tradition. Um, how do uh, we maintain those or provide some sort of reparation for that? These are really important conversations. They are likely not to get resolved at this COP, um, but are importantly on the official agenda. So stay tuned, watch the news. It's an important conversation and obviously something we're watching unfold in real time as we look at communities like Pakistan, and we look at Pakistan and many coastal communities on sm small island nations. Um, that are facing retreat and relocation now. One of the parts of this that feels super tangible to me is, and is also my favorite topic, is around food. Because I think it's really interesting how, um, as a physician, when I'm talking to my patients about what to eat, there's, you know, a lot of, lot of different um, recommendations. And at the end of the day, you really want to be able to give good advice and 99% of the time I'm follow like Michael Pollan, who's like, eat foods, mostly plants, just do that. Right. Um, and so I, that's like my, and, and as physicians, our nutritional training is probably not our strength. It's changing now in medical education, but it's not our strength for those of us that graduated several years ago. So I'd love to like, just have a conversation around food. If I said to you, how should I be eating and how does this affect planetary health and my own health? What would be advice you would give me? Well, I would I would advise you to eat a whole um, food plant based diet because I think that takes the minimum acreage away from forests. So um, I switched to that diet a couple of years ago, and I lost fifty pounds, and my cholesterol went down eighty points. And the doctor said, "Are you taking a statin?" And I said, "No, I'm not taking a statin." And he's like, "How did you do that?" Um, and the answer is um, greens, beans, mushrooms, carrots, broccoli, onions, um, you know, which do a lot less damage to the earth when you grow them than a lot of other types of food. And I want that 500 million acres Heidi was talking about. 
to increase the size of forests. Um, I can, I agree wholeheartedly. I think um, the way that I talk about it and that um, I've some of my colleagues at the Breakthrough Institute is a very cool site. If you've not checked it out, um, they did a really interesting piece on cultivated meat, which is meat grown in a lab. Anyway, um, super weird stuff, but um, cool nonetheless. Um, but on the whole plant-based foods, right? They're less resource intensive. They're better for your body um, than animal proteins. Um, however, the footprint of, an of plant-based sort of meat and um, cultivated meat can be either large or small. So there's nuances, um, but eating less beef, um, even if it's replaced with chicken or pork translates to fewer emissions and is better for the planet. And as with everything, um, moderation matters. So um, yes, plants, um, but we're not asking you to forfeit that hamburger if you really love it, but maybe just think about it as a special treat that you eat on occasion um, rather than once a week. Your doctor will thank you um, and Lee will thank you because we'll have more for us. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I have much to add other than it's even better if you know where it came from. So yeah, try to eat plants, try to know where your food came from. If you can do those two things, it's probably better. I think we're in concurrence and in agreement. I am a primary care doctor and I, and I think we will thank you um, if you follow that advice as well. All right. Um, that kind of brings us to the, there's a lot more questions in the comment and we will try to answer those either by commenting in the chat or figuring out a way to get answers back to our panelists. Um, we love the engagement from you and for everyone on the panel who has been a part of this conversation. Um, we thank you all for spending the time and your insights with us, kind of inspiring us and getting us activated on how to become the next generation for, of sustainable live, of leaders and for building this future, um, for building this future that we all want to be a part of. So thank you all panelists very, very much. Thank you so much for all of you participants in Mini Medical School. Thank you for joining us in this series. And uh, yeah, this is our last one. So we'll see you around. Thank you.